It's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Tom, Tom Killian here for just one day today. Uh, he came from, from Rice. Of course, he's not uh, an unknown uh, to many people here. He actually is starting to you may not know. Of course, most of you know that he has a PhD at MIT, but he started here as an undergraduate at Harvard. Um, but it was at MIT where he uh, made his, his mark as part of the group which eventually got the hydrogen BBC, this very elusive object which was made in 1998 in Klapnitz lab. And then after that he went to Gist, uh, I believe, to do a postdoc and he did another first there where he created the first uh, Ultra cold plasma. He was in xenon ultra cold plasma uh, in a mount, and which led to a lot of transformational uh, studies, uh, which he continued after uh, getting a faculty position at Rice, where he has been since uh, since I think it was 2000. Rice has been there uh, ever since. At Rice, he also did another first uh, in 2000. Check. It's 2009, I believe, with uh, two groups in 2009 who were able to create BEC of uh, alkaline earth atoms. In the case of rice, with the structure of 84, which was uh, to to excitation to the combination of lines. And, uh, and, and he's, he's been doing, of course, uh, great, as most of you know. Um, but lately, he decided to do something else, to do Rydberg uh, transitions in, in the structure, where, just very recently, he also found these uh, first Rydberg molecules, these very sort of exotic molecules in an alkaline earth atom. He's been the recipient of a He's been a Sloan Fellow and, uh, and, and also a Young Investigator Award. But what I also like is that he actually has now had two startups. None of which got to do with just the cold stuff, to do with mostly cellular chemistry or cellular bio. You can tell me if you're interested. Um, but uh, he was also the, the departmental chair. I think he's glad that he has a step down. You're still at the... <laughs> Sorry to hear that. So, with that, I'm going to show Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. It's wonderful to be back. As, as Hossein uh, mentioned, it really brings back a lot of memories. I, I think I've learned quantum mechanics in this room. Uh, it's really fun to walk around. and I, I really enjoy getting to talk to everybody that I've met with. It's really been a, been a great visit. So um, I'm going to talk today about some uh, some very recent results that we've been we've gotten over the last year or so in this new direction in my group on, on ripper gases in, in strontium. Um, as you can see from this list, we have a, we have a, a large number of, of collaborators. Um, on the experimental side, all this is made possible by working with Barry Dunning, who is the senior atomic physics experimentalist at Rice. Um, who's been working in Ripper atoms for, for decades, so he brings a wealth of expertise, gave me the comfort to, to go into this field. Um, and I have a wonderful group of, of um, graduate students as well, and the recent mission of Caden Hazard on the theory side has been a great help. But we've also um, uh, connected with Thomas Cole's group at Dresden, and Hossein here uh, has helped us a lot with some of the results, as well as the, the, the Bergdorfer group uh, at uh, Vienna uh, as well. So it takes a big group of people to understand uh, and, and get up to speed quickly on this stuff. So I will start by giving you a little bit of motivation for why we're getting into Rydberg atoms and, and why we're working with, with, um, with strontium, uh, why in general divalent atoms are interesting for these experiments. And I'll talk uh, most of the time on ultra-long-range Rydberg molecules. I uh, hope I have some time at the end to talk about Outler Towns spectroscopy in these systems and the signatures of river blockade and, and interesting uh, atom loss and dephasing processes that we see. Uh, but we've got a lot of new results on that molecule, so I'll probably spend most of my time 
on, on that aspect. So our, our general motivation moving into this area is all these exciting uh, proposals to do interesting antibody physics with rigid atoms in, um, in the dense gases. We, as Jose mentioned, we have the ability to make quantum gen degenerate gases. We have bosons and fermions in strontium. They're quite nice to work with. Barry Nunning has all this expertise in Rickberg gases, so you bring them all together to hopefully realize the many uh, predictions, such as seeing super solids, uh, three dimensional <coughs> solitons, interesting predictions to realize spin models of, of Rickberg excitations on, on lattices um, that are all enabled by the very strong, long range interactions between Rickberg atoms. When you pull that electron away from the nucleus, you can get very big dipole moments that give you the long range interactions and this Rydberg blockade effect um, that's led to so many interesting things. For those of you who don't know, um, the Rydberg blockade effect is um, uh, because of the strong interactions. When you excite one Rydberg atom in, in a cloud, um, the strong interactions prevent another Rydberg excitation from uh, happening within a radius called a blockade radius. This leads to very strong correlations in the gas, which can lead to lots of interesting phenomena, quantum information application, quantum optics. Uh, but our interest is mostly to move towards the, the many-body physics. But there are a lot of steps for, for getting there, and, um, and a lot of reasons why strontium is a great choice for doing this. Uh, over the last five years or so, people have been doing, doing great things on these cold cold river gases, um, but strontium, I think, brings a lot new to the table. Um, for uh, for the, the start off, the, the strontium, because of the divalent system, means that the, the core of the river atom, the strontium plus, still has one valence electron. So you can talk to that valence electron with normal, um, normal lasers, and the cameras can image those photons. In, in uh, strontium, it's a 422 or a 408 nanometer photon that can excite the core. You can use the uh, oscillator strength of that core for making optical traps that are magic wavelengths, in the sense that they'll trap the ground state and trap the rig root state as well. This can actually be very important for some experiments. You can imagine imaging the Rydberg core, so imaging the Rydberg, Rydberg um, atom itself. Um, we used that uh, uh, capability recently to image the, uh, res the evolution from a Rydberg gas into a plasma by using the optical activity of the core. Um, the, uh, you have all sorts of other physics that can happen in Rydberg atoms because of the two electrons, such as uh, doubly excited states, which have auto-ionizing states as well. And this can give you nice tools for detection of the atom or lead to some interesting um, atomic physics all in their own right. So a lot of rich stuff that just comes from the fact that there are two electrons. Um, with the two electrons come singlet states and triplet states as well, that of course go all the way up into the Rydberg manifold. And with all these extra states, you now have more types of Rydberg interactions. Depending on which Rydberg state you excite to, um, they'll have different attractive interactions or repulsive, they could be isotropic or anisotropic. So with more states to go to, you have more choices to try to find whatever kind of state you want. Um, in our case, we're going to be exciting through the triplet manifold to the triplet Rydberg states, and in particular, the triplet S1 has very near isotropic repulsive interactions. And that's a very nice and clean system to work with to uh, make nice blockade experiments, but also to interpret the, the results as well. So um, having more Rydberg states allows you to uh, hopefully find something that you, that you want. Um, there are other th things that come about because of these um, triplet levels. This is the first uh, triplet uh, manifold here, um, the lowest energy state. We have triplet P2, triplet P1, triplet P0. The triplet P0 is the clock state that uh, is uh, standards labs and many labs around the world are working on this to make the best atomic clocks. Uh, it has a very, very long lifetime. We'll typically use this triplet P1 state as our intermediate state. It's also very long-lived compared to an electric dipole um, allowed transition. Uh, it has a 21 microsecond lifetime. So this actually will uh, be very different for two photon excitation, where the intermediate state now has a lifetime on the order of the Rydberg state, rather than the normally in an alkali metal atom, or if we went through the singlet series, that intermediate state of a very, very short lifetime on the order of nanoseconds. So that gives a very broad intermediate state. And that actually can change the physics, um, the physics quite a lot. Um, the most important thing for our long range plans is that if you're going to try to um, use a two photon uh, laser to mix a little bit of the excited state into the ground state, this is Rydberg dressing. This is how, this is important for those proposals for a lot of that many body physics. 
It turns out by that the two photon excitation through a long-lived intermediate state can get you a rig coupling to the Rydberg state with less decoherence, less photon scattering. The lifetime of that intermediate state actually sets a scale for the photon scattering. So that's a, that was one of the first motivations for us to say, well, let's look at strontium and see what we can do with Rydberg atoms. So that's just one example. Um, but uh, you know, there's lots of, lots, of, lots of things, as you can see. We, and where we hope to get to that Rydberg dressing in many body physics, where all these things described here, there are actually many steps for us to, to get there. And so we're starting to take those steps and already seen very interesting things, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So mostly, the kind of things you want to work out is you want to understand what happens when you put near-resident lasers and excite the ground state atoms up to near the Rydberg manifold. You're going to have different loss processes. Um, what kind of Rydberg interactions do you have? What kind of decoherence processes do you have? Um, as we'll see, you also make molecule states that can open up extra loss channels that you need to worry about, but they're also very interesting physics in their, in their own right. So these are the preliminary results that we're, we're finding as we're moving towards this this long-term goal. So let's first talk about the ultra-long-range Rydberg molecules that, we, <coughs> that we've seen. So these are boundary states of um, one atom in the Rydberg state and one or more atom uh, in, still in the ground state. And essentially, the scattering of the nearly free Rydberg electron off the ground state atom creates a mean field potential that if the scattering length, the S-wave scattering length is negative, is, a little, is attractive. So you get a potential for the ground state atoms. Here's a, a famous plot from the very first paper uh, detecting ultra-long-range Rydberg molecules. This is the probability density distribution of the Rydberg electron, where there's a high density of finding the uh, electron. You have a deep potential well, and ground state atoms can sit in this potential well and can be trapped and stable enough to, to, uh, to, to live for many vibrational periods of, the, of their state. So we have uh, vibrational um, levels of atoms trapped in this very interesting shape potential. So these were predict predicted by uh, 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 Jose and Chris, Chris Green and others back in 2000 and first seen um, by um, Tillman Fowles group in Rubidium. Uh, and, and really the Fowl group has, has been, been leading the work on these, on these experiments. Here's uh, the, the potential that you um, sort of a mean field effective potential you would uh, write down for the atoms. You have an S-wave scattering term proportional to the probability density distribution of the Rydberg electrons. And as, as we'll see later, it's also important that you do have P-wave scattering of the electron off the ground state atom as well, because the electron can be moving fast enough to, um, to have some P-wave scattering. And it, it depends on the, um, the modulus square of the gradient of the electron wave function. But it's important that that P-wave scattering length comes in as well. But for the most part, we can, we can just think about this S-wave um, scattering term. So as I mentioned, we're going to be doing all these experiments, exciting up to the Rydberg levels through the triplet, um, uh, triplet series, slightly detuned from the triplet P1 state, so that we're off resonance there, um, and then going directly onto the Rydberg triplet S1 state, or a little bit to the red detune where we find the molecules. And we're going to excite up the principal quantum numbers between 30 and, and 40 or so. Um, and for those are just the technical details. This, this last step is done with a 320 nanometer um, laser uh, that we, we, um, we get with a, uh, a, a doubled uh, OPO um, laser uh, setup. And it works quite well. We can get a couple hundred milliwatts at 320 nanometers, which is, is, gives us really strong oscillator strength uh, or uh, transition rate to the river, river gas. We do our experiments with uh, all with 84 strontium in this case. Um, the atoms are trapped in an optical dipole trap at, at uh, 1064 um, nanometers. Um, this, in this apparatus, we can make Bose-Einstein condensates if we want to, um, and, but most of the results will be with, with just a thermal gas. Um, so these first experiments I'll, I'll show you with molecules. We're working with um, densities on the order of 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter, and that's important to know because it sets a scale for the average inner particle spacing. It's about 600 nanometers or so in this case. We're nice and cold. Um, and the, for a Rydberg atom of about n equals 35, the, uh, the classical electron radius is about 60 microns. So it's a little less than the inner particle spacing, but it's, it's close enough that you're going to get on, on, some, um, on average some ground state atoms every now and then within the wave function of the <coughs> electron as well. And that's what you need to get um, to form some molecules. And just to cut right to the chase, this is the kind of data that we, we saw in our very first experiment. 
Um, it's a little unusual for Rydberg experiments, but we actually detected uh, Rydberg excitation and molecule creation by looking at atom laws. So we just uh, we create our, our gas, and we'll shine our laser beam on it and for some amount of time, and then after that, we'll take an image of the atoms and count how many atoms are there. For if we tune our laser beam near the atomic resonance, so we excite single atoms up to the Rydberg state, just in 10 milliseconds, we'll, we'll excite and lose most of our atoms. So that's how we determine the zero of our, um, of our energy scale. And then as we tune to the red, we see these series of very weak resonances. And I say weak because we have to expose many seconds now to actually see these resonant losses. And these are the molecular states. And you can see their binding energies are on the order of, of megahertz or so. Um, so working with, uh, with Hossein here and uh, Shuya Shida and Joachim uh, Bergdorfer in, in Vienna, we were uh, able to calculate the, um, the essentially the wave functions you would expect for the, for the Rydberg, Rydberg states, the electron wave functions. And then in the, those potentials that were formed by those wave functions, um, we could um, calculate the, the vibrational energy levels and energy states for different principal quantum rooms. So this is exciting near n equals 30, near n equals 33, near n equals 36. And uh, by solving this, this Schrodinger equation, you could find the positions of the resonances. And they match the predictions quite well by adjusting these S wave and P wave um, scattering rings. Just a few features to point out that are sort of characteristics of these Rydberg molecule spectra, if you're, if you're not familiar with them. Um, you typically um, have, well, you will have one nice outer lobe of the Rydberg wave function where most of the probability density is for the electron to be found. And that makes a very deep well, which will always give you one nicely isolated uh, uh, molecular state. So this is what we call the ground state of the molecule. So there's one uh, ground state atom here. Um, in this case, about 70 or so uh, nanometers from the Rydberg atom core. Um, and that's the strongest transition at the deepest binding energy. And then you'll see weaker transitions for these other levels um, that are more weakly bound as well. There are some scaling laws that you expect to see in the spectrum. Essentially, the typical um, strength of the interaction potential will go uh, as the, the, the density, uh, probability density of the, for the electron, which will go as 1 over the volume, so 1 over the radius cubed to the, to the typical uh, electron distance. And because the size of an electron goes as the principal quantum number squared, you expect a scaling of the energy of 1 over n to the 6. So as a function of quantum number, you can plot up the binding energies and see this characteristic 1 over um, n to the and to the sixth scaling for especially the more strongly bound levels. For the more weakly bound levels, you'll start to see some deviations because you have mixing of all the different um, levels across all those different potential levels. But they're all pretty pretty well described and match the theory theory pretty well. So this is all very interesting. From this, we can extract the S wave and the P wave scattering lengths. You have to be a little careful that you, you're designating these scattering lengths at k equals zero because there certainly is a lot of a variation in scattering lengths with, with momentum. As the electron moves around in the Rydberg orbital, its, its kinetic energy is changing a lot. And you can calculate that with a semi-classical approximation, just, just uh, overall conserving potential and kinetic energy. So at different points of the, uh, of the potential, wherever an atom might sit, the electron, when it comes by, will have some characteristic momentum. And that will determine what the scattering lengths are that that atom sees and the strength of that interaction as well. So these are the zero um, um, wave vector, zero momentum values of the scattering lengths. There actually are some ab initio calculations for strontium. Um, R minus 13 or so bore for the singlet is close, but a little bit off from the, um, the ab initio calculation, which was done by Hossein. And so uh, it seems that uh, the consensus is that it's probably worth thinking about the theory a little bit more, looking a little more closely. Although this level of theoretical treatment is still a simplification. So there is some, some uh, uh, what people have seen in other atoms is that you have to go a little bit beyond the simple treatment to actually get a really good agreement between the ab initio scattering lengths and these extracted values. So there are still some things to work out here. So still things to work out, but really, well, what's really so exciting about it? Okay, so this is, this is the classic thing where, okay, somebody did with one atom, you're going to do with another atom, great, but that's not going to get you tenure. Glad I don't need to get tenure. 
Um, but uh, really, why, why shrine? Well, um, it turns out that there really are some very interesting things and some very fundamental things. And that's, that's why you know, it's, it's, um, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to you about it. All these things about the optically active core for the Rydberg atoms, they also had advantages for the molecule as well. You could imagine um, you know, finding uh, optically imaging the core of the molecular ion. You could study you know, autoionization and other things where you use that optical um, activity of the core as well. That's not so much of my, my main interest. Uh, starting to get a little more interesting is the fact that because you have that extra electron in the core, you have doubly excited states now. So here's, here's a term diagram for strontium. It's a little, little hard to read, but I think you can get the idea. Here are the singlet series, the ground singlet S, here's the ground state, and the first excited singlet S all the way up to the continuum. We have, um, here's a triplet S, and then singlet P, triplet P, all these. It's a pretty rich diagram already for singlets and triplets. But way over here, you have doubly excited states, where not only is, 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 is you know, one electron excited, but that second electron excited is stated as well. So you'll have, you know, instead of a, a 5S2 and a 5S, uh, 5P, you might have 5P, 5P, for example. So that puts extra states out here that can go and perturb this Rydberg spectrum. This was a very big field um, for many years uh, um, back, in the, back in the 80s or so. So this is all well understood, but it actually brings a richness to the, to the Rydberg molecular physics. And what it brings is the possibility of expanding the zoo of states that, that we, might, we might see. Because um, it turns out that there's actually a lot of variation in the, uh, the wave function for the um, for the electron, Rydberg electron, in these molecular states that can lead to different, different things, like very large dipole moments, for example, is one of the more interesting ones. Um, but it also leads to very interesting shapes that have gotten people excited, where you, in a particular kind of configuration, you have butterfly type states. Here's a trilobite state. Here's a rather boring first state um, that was seen. So um, it's expected that these, these perturbers will add new richness and new kind of states with more, um, uh, with more uh, more variability, perhaps uh, making it easier to access large dipole moments. We don't know, but this is still an open thing to, to think about that is worth, worth looking into. But the biggest thing, which I'm going to spend the most part of my talk on, is the lifetime of the Rydberg molecules that we create. And the lifetimes are, are is a very interesting parameter, not for many reasons. You need it to live long enough for you to do experiments on. But these experiments are moving in, in very interesting directions of putting Rydberg atoms and Rydberg molecules into quantum gases to start to think about impurity physics. And the lifetime of the Rydberg atom and the Rydberg molecules you make are going to be crucially important to see if you can actually realize some of this interesting physics to study this impurity in a quantum fluid type, type physics. So I would say that our understanding of the lifetimes of these molecule states is still in its, in its infancy. There are very few measurements. Um, this is so the first one. This is a measurement in the rubidium system, in Tillman, Tillman Fowles' group. So here are the lifetime, actually the decay rate, sorry, um, in uh, times uh, 10 to the 4 per second. So this is like 30 microsecond lifetime for the Rydberg states. This is the 35s in rubidium. As a function of, of density. And here are two molecular states, the most deeply bound ground molecular state and then the first excited one. And you see some interesting things. You see that the, the lifetime is going down with density, or the decay rate is going up. So collisions are a factor here. Um, and you also see that as you go to a more excited molecular state, you even at low density, you have an offset. So there are decay processes that are intrinsic to the molecule itself that tell us a lot about the molecular, molecular wave function. Uh, the atomic state is now down here. Um, and in this range of densities, up to around a little less than 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter, there was no observed variation of the atomic state lifetime on density. So this pointed to a lot of interesting physics. For example, the enhanced decay rate of the excited state pointed to uh, the different uh, form of the wave function and the different parts of the potential that was experienced by the excited state molecule. So here's a, it's a pretty complicated potential, so let me, let me walk you through this. Here's the internuclear distance, so the, the, the Rydberg core is, is, is down here, so we're out at about 100 nanometers or so. Um, it's a little more complicated than the potential that I showed you before for strontium. For strontium, 
you had just the nice wiggles and then one big lobe. Here you've got all this awkward shape and then some sort of a sort of a diving down to a very attractive state of shorter interactions. And this comes about because there's a, there's a P wave resonance in the scattering of the electron off the ground state out. So I'll talk about that in, in more detail in a moment. But essentially, you have this cliff, deep cliff. Over here, the potential goes way down, which essentially pulls the ground state atom into short range chemistry where reactions and all kinds of bad stuff happens that we typically don't want to study unless we're for chemistry. Um, but what it turns out is that there are actually states that were well above this, the energy required to get over this threshold. And so, um, with a little bit of uh, some, some nice, nice uh, theory calculations, they're able to show that actually in quantum reflections um, off the, the potential step here stabilized this wave function and gave you um, a, stable, a stable state there. And that explains why this uh, more excited state had a shorter lifetime or a higher decay than the ground excited state. That excited state was able to get very close to that threshold and could tunnel through to the, the inner state uh, much more rapidly. So that was the explanation for the enhanced decay. Whereas the ground state is very well isolated out here and, and doesn't really tunnel into to the ground state. So this is the story with, with rubidium. And the, the re, as I mentioned before, the reason why this is all very important is uh, the direction that the, um, some experiments in the field are moving of trying to put Rydberg atoms in the seas and quantum fluids. If you start to have lots of atoms around, then the shape of this potential and the lifetime of these states can be very important for determining how long you can look at um, you know, the interactions between that Rydberg atom and that, and that quantum, quantum fluid. So let me talk a little bit about that, that P wave resonance in rubidium because I'm going to contrast it with strontium in a moment. So here's the complicated um, potential uh, that I just showed you. Everything I showed you here, all this potential right here, is actually happening right here at this little avoided crossing between this state coming plunging down from the hydrogenic manifold through the energy of the um, one atom in the S state and one atom in the ground state. Here's the internuclear separation. And this state comes about because there is this P wave resonance in the scattering of an electron off of a ground state rubidium atom. So just to remind you, the shape resonance comes about because if you draw the, the potential of, in this case, an electron interacting with a ground state rubidium atom, so here's the electron rubidium distance, the uh, potential for L equals 1 as the centrifugal barrier, and you can have a state, uh, a metastable state behind that barrier. And if you come in and scatter at the energy of that state, you'll tunnel through, see that scattering resonance, and that gives you an enhanced um, scattering length for the P wave scattering length and enhanced scatter. So that gives you this scattering resonance. And this does exist. It's not, you don't know whether it exists or not in, in, in the um, electron atom scattering until you do the calculation. And rubidium has this, which leads to this, this complication in the, in the potential. So essentially, as I said, all this potential is right here at this little complicated crossing. And it's this potential coming down, this P wave resonance scattering state that crashes down. On an expan expanded scale, it creates this, this <coughs> tilt of the potential that brings atoms in towards the nucleus, which drives chemical reactions when you try to put a Rydberg atom into a condensate but also leads to these decreased lifetimes for the molecular state. Now, what's exciting is that strontium doesn't have this P wave resonance. So the, um, the potentials here are quite clean, and we don't expect to have this enhanced tunneling into short range uh, interaction. So we expect to have enhanced lifetimes of the molecular states, which would be very nice for, for all these other experiments that I've talked about. So a very different shape of the potential compared to this more complicated repeat one. So do we see this? What is it, how does it show up in our, in our um, experiments? So what I'm going to show you now is uh, a data from, a, from our, our new apparatus, which just came online, which is designed for Rydberg excitation. And the main improvement here is that we have charge field, uh, charge particle diagnostics. And we can apply electric field to do selective field ionization of the Rydberg atoms. So if we, as we apply electric field, um, as shown here, when we get to a certain threshold, we can ionize Rydberg atoms in a given quantum state, or principal quantum number, and we get very sensitive detection. In principle, we can detect single Rydberg atoms, and we also can do um, uh, uh, identify what state they're in by where and what field they ionize. 
So a typical experiment will be turn off the excitation and apply our field ramp. And if we want to, we can hold for a given time before applying the field ramp if we want to measure the lifetime of the molecules. But this is the typical spectrum we'll get for the, uh, as a function of the electric field um, that we apply to the, to the atoms. And just to show you what I meant about resolving uh, different, identifying the different quantum states that are occupied, here I put it on a signal on a log scale. And I put lines here which line up with when the different um, principal quantum numbers and the different uh, SP and D states will ionize. So see, initially our signal is confined to the 38S state, which is where we expect it to be. But you can see there's a little bit of um, uh, population here in the, uh, looks like the 38P. No, sorry. Yeah, about the 38P. Um, so this is a little bit of black body radiation driving transitions to the nearby, nearby P states at a very, very low level on this very short whole time. And there's lots of other structure here, too, that I'll come back and mention at the end if I have some time. So it's a really powerful tool. And um, so this is now the new spectrum that we have. So here was what I told you before, where you can see these very large, large lines with a pretty with some good signal to noise. But now here's on a log scale. So now we can detect lines that are down uh, three orders of magnitude from the atomic line. So here's the atomic line. Uh, for exciting now 38S, and we see all these other features. Um, and so some of them are, are relatively um, standard ones we saw before. Here's a ground molecular state, so one ground state atom in the outer lobe of the um, river potential. Here is a dimer formed by um, one ground state atom in the first excited vibrational state. We have the second excited vibrational state. We even have a very weak third excited transition, which we really couldn't see before. And then we see another line over here. So these are the, the principal features, but you can see other things as well. So what these other lines are, are actually trimers. So now two ground state atoms in the Rydberg, in the potential formed by the um, Rydberg wave function. And you know that what they are because they're just mirrors or translation of the, um, of the uh, dimer states translated by the binding energy of one more atom in whatever vibrational state you put it in. So for example, here's one atom in the first excited state. Here's two atoms in the first excited state. Here's one atom in the first state, one atom in the second. Here's two atoms in the second. So this whole zoo of, of, of states. Um, and we can even go further. I take all that, that, that spectrum and compress it into this region. You can go out even further and see a whole repeat of this structure as well. So a very complicated structure that is emerging. So this general feature of these trimers and, and um, tetramers and pectomers have actually been seen before in the video by, by Tilmer Faust group, but this is actually the best resolution that, that, we, that, that has been seen on these. Um, and there's a reason for that. So we'll come back and I'll mention that as well. So, so this is actually a, an exciting thing that we can pursue with strontium, that this, this, um, this spectroscopy is working so, so very well. So we have this great tool now. We can detect very tiny signals, great resolution. What can we do with it for the lifetime, to study the lifetime of these Rydberg molecules? So here's the kind of data that we take. Um, here's the atomic state first. Of course, we want to compare it to the atomic, uh, the delay of the atomic state. Here's the selective field ionization, so the, the detected signal as a function of electric field um, for various hold times. So we excite, and then we wait, and then we ramp up the electric field. So this is where most of the population is for very short hold times. Mostly everything's in the 38S state. But as you hold for longer, go from blue to red, you can see that population is decaying. Up. So we're seeing some loss in the population of 38S state. This is happening during, due to several things. You certainly have black body transitions. And you can see that because you have discrete populations coming up, and their population's getting larger with time than the initial state. So you have a transfer mostly from S to the nearby P states. But overall, the population is going down, and that's due to the natural decay. The, 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 the atoms are primarily decaying from S states to very low-lying P states, which are no longer rubric atoms, and we don't, we don't see them anymore. It's a little bit of a complication, but I have to be a little bit careful about how I calculate the lifetime, what signal I take. You could imagine integrating up just the 38S peak and looking at that decaying, and that's going to measure the decay, including black body radiation. Now, maybe I don't want to include black body radiation. So you could say, well, I'll just sort of integrate the whole signal, and that'll roughly be uh, an approximate of the decay excluding black body radiation. That's a little bit sloppy. People do it, and it's sort of a common mistake. 
because you, it's going to distort your lifetime because these P states live different amounts of lifetimes than the S states. It's not great, but I'll do it that way most of the time because that'll allow me to compare with the radiant measurements because that's what was done in Virginia. They just detected everything. So for the time being, we'll do that, but we'll come back and, and, and mention that a little bit because we need we can certainly do a little better. And we can model this decay with a calculation of the black body rate, which is easy to calculate. I would probably measure this this state and subtract off the black body rate to get my intrinsic rate. But for now, it doesn't really change our results for where we are now. But a lot of interesting interesting stuff is going on. Here's what we see for now a molecular state. So this is the molecular ground state, n equals 38. Again, the electric field ramp here, sig logarithmic signal. For the most part, we see the signal at the 38 S peak as well. When we excite, this is now putting our laser on top of that molecular resonance. So we know we're making molecules. A lot of great stuff here. This is this data is very new. You can just overall look and see there's different features here. Look at this, this huge shoulder, which you don't see at the atoms. I'll come back to that a little bit. But for now, don't worry about that too much. And again, it's going to be the same idea where we'll integrate the whole signal and just call that, use that integral to get our, our decay rate as well. As we hold different amounts of time, you can see the signal go down. That's giving us the decay rate for these molecules. But this is what we see. Here's the atomic state, the total integrated population as a function of time. And I'm showing it for different densities that go from about 1 to 4 times 10 to the 13. So I'm showing this raw data for, for a couple of reasons. First, to show you that there's definitely a density effect. The red data, the high density, is, is clearly decaying faster. And the blue, the low density, is decaying more slowly. It goes from red to blue for the atomic state and for the molecular ground state. So we have good enough resolution to really measure it. However, it's a small effect. So the, the atoms, uh, the density over these densities, which are pretty good densities, 4 times 10 to the 13, are not giving us a lot of loss, which is already nice, nice to see. Uh, but to emphasize, we can measure even these very small differences in, in, the, uh, in the loss rate. So now I take curves like that, and I plot up the, the slope, the, the, the decay rate, um, as a function of uh, the density. And here we have um, four different curves. So I'll try to show, help you out figuring out what, what curves they are here. This is the atomic state over here. So that, that's excited the atomic state. You see this curve. So a very, very slow the, um, increase in the decay rate with density. So there is some collisional effect. The decay rate is about 30 uh, times 10 to the 3 per second, which corresponds to about a 30 microsecond lifetime, which is about what you expect from the natural lifetime for this state. Now, if I go to the first excited molecular state, you see um, the purple curve here. And within our experimental error, it extrapolates to about the same natural lifetime at low densities. And it's a little bit more sensitive to density than the ground state. The second excited molecular state shows very similar behavior. So a little bit more sensitivity to density, but again, extrapolating back to the um, atomic lifetime at low density. So what that says is for the very most bound state and the first excited molecular state, the decay rate due to natural decay is the same as the atomic state. So what you basically just see is the, the electron uh, moving around the Rydberg atom is unaffected by the um, ground state atom being there, and it decays down with the same natural decay rate. However, the third excited state, which would be the blue one over here, it has an offset. So extra decay, about 25% extra decay. And surprisingly, we wouldn't have expected this, but it, it's intrinsic to the molecular wave function. So somehow, this molecular wave function must be tunneling into the core and giving you some chemical reactions. Um, I think it's a little bit surprising, though, that you see this, this difference when you're, you're, the wave function is still not going in very far to the core. So this is uh, something we still need to, still need to understand. Um, so this is sort of the, the lay of the land in terms of uh, the lifetimes, the density dependencies, and the differences between the molecular and the, um, and the atomic states. Um, just to show you that it doesn't really matter what metric I use, I could take the integral with the black body, and I get the straight lines here. And it comes out the same pattern. There's an offset of about 10 to the 4 per second, which is a typical black body rate for this system. Um, and just by getting the same um, uh, uh, sort of hierarchy of time scale, sensitivity to density, so it really doesn't matter what metric I use, I get the same answers for what's happening to a rigor molecule in a dense gas. So, okay, so in, in, in isolation, those are just decay rates, density dependencies. Um, 
what's, what's interesting about it? Because it doesn't reflect back to something, something intrinsic. Well, to, um, to, to make that statement, let's go back and compare it to the Rubidium results here. So here is the results from that, that, that file paper. Again, this is the ground molecular state, the first excited molecular state as a function of uh, density. Now, these densities go up to about 8 times 10 to the 12th. So to put them on the my graphs, they all fit into this density regime right over here. So we're going to much, much higher densities. And you can see, now here's their, their raw data put on the spot as well. I've added the atomic state. For the ground molecular state, they, they claim is extrapolate down, that back down to about the atomic state. Their first excited state has this extra decay. But the thing that jumps out at you is that the strontium sensitivity to density is much, much lower, or, or you know, at least an order of magnitude, lower sensitivity to density um, uh, than the, um, than the uh, um, rubidium molecules. And this, this has to be, be coming from the shape of the potential. One of the beautiful things about Rickberg atoms is the electrons are out there. You know, it's, it's a relatively simple system. Um, so it has to be coming about, these enhanced sensitivity has to be coming about from this P wave resonance, pulling atoms in to the core. Um, so this is a little different than the picture that was presented in this original paper. The thought was that it's just some sort of collisional thing, that ground state atoms are colliding with the Rickberg molecules, and there was some cross section given by the uh, classical radius of the Rickberg electron, but that would be the same for rubidium, for strontium, so that can't be, can't be the case. So strontium has this greatly enhanced lifetime, um, which is really reflecting the, the important role of that P wave resonance um, in, in, uh, in rubidium for dominating and the absence of it in strontium. So we're very excited about this. It's kind of opened up a whole new uh, research avenue for us that we really weren't expecting when we got into this. But I think that strontium is really going to be you know, the system to work with to do, going forward, do a lot of this exciting molecular physics um, for looking at the molecules, getting the spectra of, of very complicated regions. As we go down, part of the reason why these were resolving things so well is probably also related to this enhanced lifetime. We can get high densities that we, where we could form trimers and probably tetramers and pentamers, but that, at that high density will still have good lifetimes of the states, which I think will help us to really work out some of the interesting chemistry of these molecules as well. And of course, I think the more interesting thing is to go to that impurity physics where you put Rickberg atoms into the quantum fluids, where I also think this will be uh, a, a, great, a great advantage for us as well. Um, another thing that we, we've just started to look at, but I think very interesting, if you, here now I've put on one plot the field ionization curve for both the atoms, which is the yellow curve here, and all the molecular states. So the first, second, the ground, the first, and the second molecular state, they're, they're normalized, but the shape of these curves are all the same for the molecules and um, very different for the atomic state. Here, if I put in a log plot, you can see there's this big shoulder of population in the, um, in the molecular state. So we still have a lot of work to do, but uh, the, the first most naive hypothesis is that essentially um, this selective field ionization is projecting the um, the molecular wave function back on the atomic basis. And in the strontium, uh, the molecules we're seeing the, the atoms, the ground state atoms are perturbing the, um, the electronic wave function to mix in these other principal quantum number states. That needs to be checked, but that's, that's certainly a, a, a simple first hypothesis. So that'd be very interesting. Um, no one's, to my knowledge, looked at the field ionization profile of these molecules to really look closely at how the ground state atom is perturbing the wave function. Typically, it's just uh, neglected that back action of the ground state atom on the Rickberg wave function. So the exciting stuff to do, to do here. So there's a lot more to do with the molecules. We need to complete our analysis. We want to think more carefully about how to isolate the decay rate of the molecules so we can make our measurements more, more quantitative. Um, the, looking at uh, other Rickberg states and core excitation perturbers, um, there's lots of rich physics comes out when you go to different group group states. Um, you know, we can, uh, an exciting thing with these molecules, looking at the permanent dipole moments, which can be, be huge, um, and looking at trimers and tetramers, and then moving towards um, the physics of impurity atoms, putting you know, one Rickberg atom in the condensate, and seeing if you can see signs of flaritons or things like this, where the ion polarizes the surrounding fluid. So there's some interesting many body physics connections that can be done there as well. Okay, so I have maybe you know, five, five or seven minutes or so left, so I'm going to kind of switch gears, but go through this pretty quickly to, to that last topic. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, 
our main motivation going into this field was to look at uh, strongly interacting many-body gases. Um, and so there are some interesting things that we've seen there as well. So the strong interactions between the river gases are due to this, this van der Waals interaction in our regime, so C6 over R6 between two, two river gases. And it's, it underlies this river blockade effect and all these interesting applications. So in order to get there, we have to figure out a way. Most of these applications require putting a laser on to mix a little bit of the river atom into the ground state. So it's very important to understand how that laser mixing a little bit of the river atom into the ground state is going to lead to inelastic processes, because river atoms are very fragile. Uh, what kind of decoherence processes do you have? Um, so those are the questions you need to, need to answer if you have any hope for seeing this kind of physics. So the, the tool that, that we've sort of uh, started with is to do um, coherent two-photon spectroscopy, so electromagnetically induced transparency or, or outward towns, depending upon the, the intensities of the various lasers, essentially two lasers uh, very close to resonance. Um, so this first laser is going to be our weak probe laser, and the second laser exciting that triplet P state up to the excited Rydberg state is a very intense laser. Um, so we're going to be in the Atwood Towns regime, where it strongly mixes these states, so we get a dressed um, intermediate plus minus Rydberg, intermediate plus Rydberg state, split by the Robbie frequency of that, of that laser. And then our probe laser, as it tunes through, when it excites to one of these dressed states, we see enhanced loss. So we're back to studying, uh, we're, this is uh, data from our earlier apparatus where we look at trap loss measurements. So the trap loss comes about through many processes. Uh, basically, if there's a river population in your excited state, there are many things that can make that river gap go away. Um, and that gives us the signature of this spectrum. So, um, and we're going to look at, it turns out that the out of town spectrum and the very closely related um, electromagnetically induced transparency, this coherent spectroscopy is very sensitive to the interactions between the Rydberg atoms. And we'll use that to be a, to a probe of the Rydberg atom interactions in our gas. So there's been a lot of nice work on this, um, but all at much lower densities, typically 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter kind of density. So we're in a little bit different regime, and we're also in a different regime um, because of strontium, we have that very narrow intermediate state. So that also that helps us get into this outward towns regime. If you really go down and look at the look at the map, and it changes the hierarchy a little bit. So that this probe really works works out to be a very very nice one, and um, for, for 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 modeling as well. Um, okay, so I already mentioned we're detecting trap loss to these two dressed states for the most part. So the key thing is we only see loss when we excite to the Rydberg state. So anywhere you see some loss, you know you've gone to the Rydberg state. So um, we want to do short excitation pulses in these experiments. Just a couple of microseconds, it turns out, will be enough. Uh, if we go much longer, we see a lot of messy stuff. That doesn't make too much loss. So to enhance the loss, we'll do many, 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 many pulses. But separated by a long enough time for all the atoms to decay back to the ground state. So we amplify the loss by, by doing 10, 20, 30, or 40 pulses. Um, we're going to model it with a three-level um, uh, optical block equations. And so we'll have an omega-0-1 for this Robbie frequency on the lower state, and an omega-1-2 for the strong Robbie frequency from the intermediate state to the river zone. And we have loss processes from the upper state just at total loss, and then we have decay rates back to these states. That's the model that we, we put into it. Um, for the, our parameters, we'll work in densities. We could go up to BC, but for the most part, we're in the 10 to the 13, 10 to the 12 regime. Um, for the people who are familiar with this, may be interested, the blockade radius is on the order of a micron. The number of atoms within a blockaded volume is about 4 to 20. So that can get us up into the blockaded regime if you have a high excitation fraction. But if we're uh, off resonance and in between the two outer towns peaks, we have very little excitation, so we, we shouldn't be in a blockaded regime there um, for most of our experiments. So what's the effect on the outer town spectrum of the gas? So here is a low density, and we're increasing the probe frequency. We always keep the excited state Robbie, Robbie frequency about 2 megahertz. So we see the splitting of about 2 megahertz. As we increase the probe Robbie frequency, we're getting more excitation, more excitation to the, to the excited states. And so we should get more interactions. And what you see, it's a little subtle to see the low density. You see the line shifts a little bit, shifts to the right, and you get a little bit of an asymmetry of the peaks at the low density. For the high density, 
um, gas, 10 to the 13, the, the, it's much more pronounced. You see much larger shift, you see broadening, you see loss showing up on residents as well. So this is our data. To, um, to explain this data, I would say, let me, let me give, a, give a brief aside, this shift of the spectrum is what you would expect for a naive picture of the interactions. If you have two Rydberg atoms in the excited state, they're going to shift their energy levels a little bit, and so that's like detuning your UV laser. That's like having this laser detuned from resonance. Normally, we, we, sit it, we sit this laser right on resonance all the time. But when there's interactions, it shifts that excited state level and detunes it, and that gives you an asymmetry of the outer town speaks, if you, if you remember. So for weak interactions, that's what you see. But that's not enough to explain all the data. For, I'll tell you why. I'm running a little short on time, so I'll have to go through this quickly. We do a, a simple uh, density matrix calculation, and we model the shift due to the river levels in sort of a mean field way, but not with a pure mean field. Essentially, we'll take the, we'll take the, um, the energy level, the detuning for this level, and shift it by um, some interaction term times the population in the excited state. So it's a single atom um, uh, density matrix equation. Dephasing is going to be important, so we'll also have a dephasing term, also proportional to the, um, the, the density matrix element for population in the Rydberg state. So we have these two terms added on to all these messy equations I hope you've all, all seen before. So these we can solve reasonably well. We have to be a little tricky on this interaction term. Uh, if I take the, the normal um, van der Waals interaction, by dimensional scaling, you expect a density squared kind of dependence. But if you do traditional mean field, you'd average this over the density, and you assume the density is uniform, it diverges. You get an infinite um, um, value for this mean field energy. So classical mean field won't work. So what we do is we modify it to take into account the Rydberg blockade. We essentially add correlations, which goes beyond mean field. Mean field always neglects all these correlations. So we essentially cut off the integral at the blockade radius. We say at distance shorter than the blockade radius, we won't have another Rydberg atom. And this now gives us a finite result and gives us an interaction that scales with the density. So rho is the background density gas. Rho 2, 2 times rho is the average density of Rydberg atoms. So we have our interaction scaling with the average density of Rydberg atoms. And that's what we identify as this v rig rho 2, 2 term. We use local density approximation to take into account the density of homogeneity in the trap. Um, even with a local density approximation, we need some dephasing to add broadening. That I don't have a good microscopic model for. So we just say it's about the same, same we use the same functional form. Um, typical values of this, this parameter, um, this v, v, uh, C6 over blockade radius cubed, for our densities are on the order of tens of megahertz or so. So it's a pretty strong interaction term. This form of interaction, in terms of a linear scaling, has been seen in the dephasing of a Rydberg excitation experiment in Stuttgart and Fall group, um, but not in level shifts. And, and, and people haven't really looked at too closely in the microscopic model as well. So this is it's a little bit of new, new ground here, although it's in the spirit of other things that happen. So probably going a little quick. So we can really identify the the, the contribution from the shift as opposed to the dephasing. I'll have to, uh, shift over that a little bit, a little bit quickly to go to the results here. So here's low density data, again increasing the probe intensity, so increasing the population of um, uh, excitation when you're on the dress state resonance, and increasing the Rydberg fraction if you're off resonance, because there's always a little bit of Rydberg fraction there as well. So as you increase that excitation strength with no interactions, you get the red curve. So clearly our data is deviating from the no interactions. If we just turn on the level shift, you get the green data. And it's pretty close, close to the right way, but it doesn't quite get things right. If I now add on the dephasing, it gets my best fit. That's the black data. And the amazing thing is that it kind of matches the order of magnitude. There's really no fit parameters here. I just set these alphas, these scaling parameters of one. So kind of the raw values I calculated, they work pretty well. Now, I go to the high density, use the same parameters, and cut to the chase, the alpha and beta equals 1 also fit this data as well. Here's a higher excitation fraction, you get huge shifts, huge broadening, and the same terms really, really fit well. There is some extra loss showing up on resonance, and that we don't, that's, that's, that's going beyond our model, it doesn't fit, but the rest of it fits really well. 
So, you know, the one conclusion, which is sort of the one I wanted to get to, is the fact that this model works is essentially evidence for the root blockade. Because this, 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 the, the scaling with linear density of the interactions only comes about when you put these correlations in, which really are from the river blockade. So the fact that this scaling work is basically showing that we're seeing clear evidence of the river blockade in these out of town studies. I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll skip over. If we go to longer excitation times, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. We see extra features showing up right on residence, which is a total collapse of the coherence in the out of town states. And we see interesting optical bistabilities of that decoherence coming and going. Lots of interesting physics here that we're, we're working on, on explaining. Um, sort of the bad news under here is that for, I need to excite for more than a couple microseconds to do all those exciting regressing experiments. So we have to figure out how to get around this extra loss to do those super solid, solid time kind of physics. So we're still working on that. But a lot of interesting physics that we're figuring out along the way. So this is an exciting time for um, ultra cold alkaline earth atoms and Rydberg atoms. Uh, add them together. It's really, it's really a new frontier. Lots of exciting stuff happening. Many opportunities and questions um, to, 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 to figure out. For river dressings, we really need to figure out the strong dephasing and the loss. Um, so we're, we're still working on that. We, we now can bring those EIT and Albert Towns experiments into our new apparatus where we have charge particle detection. And that should really help us figure things out uh, in there as well. Uh, perhaps we can, we can put river gatherings in lattices that might affect these loss processes. And with the molecules, we have lots of exciting things to do there as well. So with that, I will, I will, I will close and uh, take questions, and thank you for your attention. So I, I have a general question about the spectral reflect time. Uh, symmetry allows to have not only vibration of state, which you detected, but also rotation. I didn't see any trace because even common molecule you have a uh, vibrational yeah. level, rotational, and I don't see that rotational level should be out. Yeah. So the so the rotational spacing for a one micron or separation or 100 hundred is is <coughs> different. Uh, the, the B constant is just so small that uh, we the atoms don't live long enough okay. to make a rotation. Molecules don't live long enough, and so we, we don't resolve it. You don't have enough time to resolve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. it. Is uh, you said, I think, that you didn't have a microscopic model for the dephasing in the last part of the talk, but is it consistent with what you might estimate just from uh, these molecules that you've studied, where a ground state atom comes through and just hits it? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. You know, they, we're making very, very few of these molecules. Um, and so you know, that, those, those molecule excitations, you know, you're going you're to make, you know, we're exciting for one microsecond, two microseconds or so. That is how long I did the molecule experiments, and I made like one or two molecules in my whole sample for the molecule experiment. Whereas in these rib, uh, rib regressing experiments, EIT, I've got now my whole cloud. So if I had just one molecule in there, it's not moving very fast. So I don't think it would have much time to really come and have an effect that would be a significant perturbation on the, on the spectrum. Well, but it's not the number, absolute number of molecules, but the number relative to the number of rib atoms that you have. Yeah. Right? We, have we have a lot of rib atoms in there. We can have excitations of 5-10% of the atoms are up in the Rydberg states. So these, these excitation fractions are getting up pretty... So the dephasing rate you see is larger than what you would estimate? Yeah. Last time. I don't think... I think there are a couple things that we can think about. One, one, one could be is that there's nothing, there's no real decohering process at all. It's just that not only do I have an average density that's varying, but I have a stochastic variation in the separation, the atom-atom separation. So if I add that stochastic variation, I get atoms close together, close further apart. And then if I add that kind of stochastic averaging, as well as local density approximation, if you go through it all, that's another source of broadening on my apparent spectrum. So it could just be stochastic. It could be that essentially, this is this now gets a little off shake your ground, but you've just got a many body system. And you're exciting up to this, 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 this um, system where now your excited state is the excitation can kind of hop around other atoms, and that just leads to decoherence of the spectrum. So you don't have to add it in the Hamiltonian, but in a many-body setting, you're going to get these decoherence processes. That, that's, that seems to be Thomas Poles or argues more for that as a source. He's working for on a little better theory that, that goes beyond a single atom picture. Questions? So in the first part of your talk, were you um, and these measurements on the uh, lifetime of Hertford molecules, it seemed that the 
k range scales linearly with density. Yep. So is this a two-body collision of a non-ripper 